Hi guys, uh, welcome back. Uh, in case you haven't been paying attention, this is actually the second uh, video in a tutorial on how to paint a Hundred Years War Knight on a horse. Uh, last week I talked about painting the horse and the horse's caparison, and this week we're going to be talking about the knight himself, and we're going to be uh, painting his armor using the non-metallic metal technique. Um, so if you haven't seen the last video, you can just pick up right here because they're pretty separate concepts. You don't necessarily have to watch them both, but if you're interested, uh, I do recommend that you take a look at the horse painting uh, section, which is going to be linked down below here in the, of this video in the description box. So as usual, uh, here are all the colors that you're going to need uh, for this specific part of the tutorial. So this is for the knight himself and sort of everything associated with him. Uh, and there you can see there is a little bit of overlap in terms of what we use here with uh, what we used on the horse, but there are also uh, some new colors as well. So this is everything. The really first step here on the armor is to get a base coat. Um, and the base coat you use here will have a big effect on sort of the ultimate look of the armor. Um, normally when I'm painting something, I tend to go with sort of the very darkest shadow color and work my way up. But you don't necessarily want to do that when you're doing non-metallic metal armor. I find, at least personally, it's a little bit easier to try to choose the sort of mid-tone on the armor and then add some really dark shadows afterwards on one end and then highlight up. Uh, I've got the dark gray from Vallejo here that I'm using as my base coat. And you've got a lot of latitude here too in what color you choose because, you know, you maybe you want a sort of a bluer armor, you want a lighter colored armor, a darker colored armor. Uh, the choice you make here will f influence that. Uh, I want this armor to really be sort of a dark uh, black gray armor because I think it will complement the orange on the horse and, you know, the um, livery very well. So this is going to be a sort of a darker style of non-metallic metal armor that I'm aiming for here. And what I just said, that I don't start with the darkest possible shadow as my base coat, uh, I'm actually adding that now. So I've taken some of the dark gray, I've added black to it to make it even darker, and I put in just a hint of blue. There's no blue paint I know in the introduction because it doesn't really matter. Any blue paint will do. Just pick a, any color you like. You're putting in such a tiny amount of it, the actual shade is fairly irrelevant. But uh, as you're working, you're going to kind of consistently want to be adding just a drop of blue into everything just because uh, metal like this, it looks good when it has a slight uh, blue cast. But what I'm doing here is I'm building up deep shadows on the model. Um, I'm going to use it to carefully line between all the sort of armor plates and segments. That's a fairly obvious thing to do with it. Uh, but also, I'm going to be applying it to areas of the metal that are, where there's really not very much light hitting. So uh, under the arms and sort of, uh, in this case, since he's on a horse, sort of the, the sort of the back half of his legs and things like that. Uh, when you're, we've got non-metallic metal, you really want to think anytime there's any sort of like, not a break exactly, but when there's sort of a, a sharp divide in the surface, like you often will see on armor, like on the, on the knees or on the legs. So you, you get sort of a, a fold in the metal. Uh, you really often want to have one side be quite light relative to the other side. So on one side of that edge, you're going to have a dark line and on the other side, a much lighter line. So I'm really uh, building that in here uh, at this point. Uh, the bassinet, that's his helmet, is another area where you're really going to want to be careful. I don't actually show a lot of painting that, that in this video just because it's very difficult to show on camera because holding the figure in a way where I can actually paint it and show it on camera are not compatible. Uh, the main thing you need to know is uh, it's tricky. Uh, I recommend you actually look at some pictures of real life or reproduction bassinet to get some sense of how light is going to hit a surface like that uh, because, you know, it, it's just going to vary quite a bit. I'm now going to start on the highlighting process. I've taken some dark sea gray and mixed it into my dark gray to lighten it. And again, of course, I'm still working with blue. And I'm going to start uh, sort of picking out areas of the armor where I sort of want to emphasize, um, you know, where light is going to be hitting. Um, at this point, we're um, what we really still want is to get real subtle, smooth transitions and blending. Um, 
There's so much to know about getting non-metallic metal right. I can't even really describe it all in this video, but I would definitely say right now, this is not a technique for beginners. So don't just like pick up the paintbrush and having done almost nothing and go into this. You really need to make sure you have a solid grasp of some other techniques first. Like you need to really understand how to mix your paint well so you get a good smooth, even mix that you, you really understand how colors work with each other. And really importantly, you really have to understand blending. I, I'm going to be honest, say you really just, I wouldn't even consider non-metallic metal unless you know how to blend. It's a technique that's basically impossible without blending. So if you don't want to blend, you don't, or you can't learn or whatever, just forget it. This is not for you. Um, anyway, but what I am doing here right now at this point is using some very sort of very gradual highlights, uh, and sort of blending them slowly into each other. Um, as I said, I'm still following the rule. Whenever you see sort of, there's a sharp break or divide in the armor where you get facets in anything, I always make sure one side is going to be light uh, and one side is going to be dark. And you're going to be thinking of the metal as a reflective surface. So you really, really, really want to pay attention where light's coming from much more so than we would with anything else. So you need to think, you know, we're assuming we're going to have the light coming from the top because that's the most generally useful. So then you really want to start making sure that there's, it looks like you've got lighter gray on the tops of the feet, for example, the tops of the arms, the shoulders, uh, anywhere. If you think, light is going to hit that's where you want uh, an exercise you can do to help you figure this out if you're not sure is uh take your figure put it under in a dark uh sort of box or area uh shine a pretty bright light on it so you get really stark highlights or light and contrast effects and then take a photograph of that and that'll help you that can help you figure out you know where you need to think about uh light hitting the armor I'm just continuing again, building up subtle highlights on the metal now, just continuing to lighten that mix I already had with more of the dark sea gray, sort of gradually uh, get making it lighter and lighter. Uh, the more steps you do here, the more time consuming, that's the whole process of painting is going to be, but the easier it's going to be for you. If you make bigger jumps, you're going to have to do more intensive blending. It's going to be a lot more work and getting an even result is going to be harder. So uh, taking the time with more layers will just make your life easier, especially if you're not very confident with blending yet. It just saves you time. So I'm just building up more and more layers and really, again, continuing to just focus on emphasizing the bright parts of the metal where I think light is going to be following and sort of blending those into the dark. That's the one thing you'll see a lot with uh, when you're doing non-metallic metal is you often have these sort of stark differences. So you may actually have an area of very, very light right next to an area of very dark, sometimes even with a really sharp transition between them. Uh, so, you know, that's, so you're, you're really often building up these really, um, heavy gradients when you're doing non-metallic metal. It's not like, um, a fairly subtle sort of transitions like you get on cloth. You have to go sometimes from a really, really, really light gray, very quickly, uh, grade uh, and sort of gradating to a very, very dark color, because that is what you see with metal. If you have light shining on it, it tends to... Uh, do that you have this really bright area and very quickly goes to an almost black sort of dark area nearby anytime you're painting non-metallic metal you're obviously going to really get the best results if you have a really strong photographic reference you're using so if you're in the lucky position where you've got an actual photograph of a knight in armor for example looks exactly like the kind of armor you're painting who's in a relatively similar pose to the one you're painting with a light source that is like from top down or whatever you want then that is like the awesome awesome sort of ultimate sort of thing you could wish for uh you're, realistically you're probably not going to get that very much but if you do that's great or if you can sort of set up a situation where you've got a reference like that to work from because then you can really get very sort of very close to reality with how the light hits the metal and you can get all these sort of shines and reflections and stuff on the metal that would be very difficult to sort of just synthesize out of your head so that's great if you can manage that if you if you can i definitely recommend you do it um but if you don't have a reference like that what you really have to be doing to, to sort of 
work out this whole situation is get really, really used to seeing what metal looks like. So, you know, whenever you have a chance, just look at metal items, study them constantly, think about them, think about how light hits. Like I do it all the time, like when I'm in the bathroom uh, and I don't have anything to do. Uh, there's a lot of metal fixtures and fittings in most people's bathrooms. And I just like sit there and I look at them. I look at them all the time. Every time I have a chance, I look at like how light is hitting them, what's the light doing on the surface, how's it refracting, reflecting, you know, it, it just train yourself to do that all the time. So you kind of start to internalize it after a while if you can. And then that'll really, really help you sort of just instinctively get the right result when you're painting on any sort of surface. That's what you want to work towards because then, you know, it doesn't really matter what the metal is you're doing. You can just sort of figure it out and you don't have to be too reliant on a really uh, specific example. Obviously that takes a really long time to get there. That's a lot of practice. I'm obviously not that good yet, but you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a way, I think that's the way you should try to learn non-metallic metal because it, it's hard. It'll take a long time. It's difficult but that's how learning it that way is going to make you the most flexible and you know just give the ultimate sort of best results when you're working uh, by this point i've just uh, moved up to pure uh, dark sea gray as a highlight color and this is really where painting non-metallic metal starts to get really really fun um when you're doing this sort of darker color, sort of building up those gradual sort of transitions and sort of laying the groundwork, that can be tedious and you don't really see a lot of kind of progress, I guess. You don't really see, oh, this looks like a metal surface I'm painting here. You know, what am I doing? But as soon as you start getting these brighter, lighter colors, uh, it starts to get a lot more interesting in some ways a lot more challenging. Um, now, this is not nearly as light as I'm gonna go on this armor, but as a, this armor, as I said at the beginning, I do want it to be a darker gray. It's not going to be really bright, shiny uh, metal. And that is, in some ways, if you're starting out, probably easier. Uh, if you have to do a really bright, like, glistening, sort of silver-looking thing, that is much, much more difficult to get looking good uh, from a realism standpoint. And also, you tend to have way more reflections and all sorts of things going on on the surface that you have to take into account. If you've got a dollar sort of more muted metal surface you're painting, it's a lot easier to tackle. So that's one reason I'm doing this here, not just because I think that darker gray fits better with the orange. Uh, anyway, at this point, what I'm doing with the dark sea gray really is, again, just really emphasizing the highlight areas a lot more uh, strongly than I had before. Um, what you'll often see and I'm starting to do that here, is even when you've got a really dark area of the metal, you'll often see if there's an edge sort of abutting that, then you'll see that a very light color sort of will sort of break down into that or, or sort of transition down into that, but only along the extreme edge in a very, very thin line. And I've already transitioned here to using my number zero brush instead of a number one. And I recommend when you're doing this really fine work and painting all these, uh, edges and little detail bits on the armor that you get a number zero brush, brush because it's really important here that you get really crisp, sharp, clean details and lines and you really want those sharp transitions uh, when you're painting metal if you want to look good. After I've applied, applied the layer of just pure uh, dark sea gray, I'm going to make subsequent layers after this by lightening the uh, dark sea gray using uh, silver gray, which is obvious choice I think for painting uh, steel and it has almost a pearlescent quality to it it's not metallic but it comes close again these are all Vallejo colors uh, check out the intro if you want to see what the models look like um, this color I'm working with here is very 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 bright already um, and I'm starting to build up now some sort of uh, reflections on the metal this is something you have to do very subtly and very, very sparingly with a very light color. And you have to be very, very careful when you do it. Uh, you don't want much of this, but this is really what makes it pop. This is what is going to make it look ultimately like non-metallic metal. Uh, so, you know, I, I think the process of painting this, you can really divide it into two parts. The first is sort of the kind of the drudgery, the you laying a good groundwork of solid sort of dark and medium grays that are kind of blended smoothly together. And then the second part is taking some very light grays or whites and very judiciously uh, applying them in very thin, precise uh, lines to your uh, metal. A little bit of blending too, but mostly you're applying very thin, small areas of these colors. 
uh, to really emphasize edges and sharp uh, areas on the armor. Uh, and when you get to this point, there's actually not even going to be all that much blending going on. A lot of this is because the lines you're working with are so fine and so thin, and assuming you're keeping your paint nice and smooth and thin too, uh, this is really going to be, you know, a lot about just precise paint work, precise brush work, and just, you know, being very careful uh, where you put your brush. I'm even going to eventually work up to the point where my f highest edge highlights are just pure silver gray, which is a really, really light color. And you can see here I am applying that to some of the really sort of most extreme edges on the model where I think a, light, a lot of light's hitting where I'm really trying to make it look like, hey, this is shiny, you know, this is where, you know, you're getting a glint from, you know, a reflection being cast, uh, that kind of thing. I, this is personally for me, this is kind of the most fun part of painting the armor because this is where everything really starts to come together. But at the same time, you have to really uh, be careful not to overdo uh, this effect because then you will lose the believability. And you want to be constantly checking the whole time you're working, you know, looking at what you're doing, kind of critically examining it, seeing if it looks right, if the effect is working. And even though, I mean, I say this is the color I'm applying now, pretty much constantly I have other colors on standby, like medium gray and sort of a dark black gray as well, which I can use to quickly go back and correct mistakes or sort of adjust or even out an area that I think needs to be a different color. Realistically, when you're doing something like this, you're not just ever working with one color at a time. You, it's, it, you always have sort of other colors ready so that you can, you know, make adjustments as you go along to the things you see that aren't, that just don't look quite right to you, or just touch up areas where you put paint where you didn't want it, or just improve a blend where you think it's a little uneven. At this point, I'm going to be working on the chainmail. He's got a coif and a little bit of a skirt showing. Uh, the way you approach chainmail with non-metallic metal, it's it's a lot easier for sure than the other sort. It doesn't have to be quite as reflective or anything like that. I'm just base coating it here with the dark gray again, and I'm going to use a technique that I use when I'm doing metallic. Um, uh, mail as well, which is really to take other shades and sort of lightly overbrush the surface so that it sort of s sits on the top and doesn't go down in the cracks. Here I am, I've got the dark sea gray, uh, I've darkened a little bit and I'm overbrushing uh, my base. Uh, and then it's also another thing that this you do with uh, non-metallic mail that's basically like what you do with any other kind is once you've got a couple layers of overbrushing down, you're going to want to apply a nice heavy wash. I used Nolan Oil here to start with and you want to go real thick here because you really want it to go down into all the crevices in the mail and really uh, stick there. You may even find it useful to build up a couple layers of this or apply it more strongly in areas of uh, shadow where you want to emphasize that. After I put on one layer of the uh, wash, I then tend to go back in again and with some lighter grays and overbrush the male here just to sort of emphasize some highlight areas a little bit. Uh, I'm kind of working sort of thin horizontal strokes on the male here and that helps sort of emphasize the sort of the knitted appearance of the male with sort of these rows of ringlets. Uh, and I think, and you don't have to make the rows, you don't have to consistently finish the row all the way around, but just sort of make an indication of sort of horizontal lines in that uh, mail, I think usually uh, looks really, really good. Uh, you can continue sort of apply, applying fairly high highlights in some place just to get a little bit of shine on the mail here and there. Again, not over the whole thing and it, always over brushing, but just sort of uh, you know, indications of some different color variation in the mail looks uh, really good. Uh, I, mail is definitely one of those few exceptions that I've, to the rule that I often say is don't finish anything with a wash. Uh, mail is one of the things where I think finishing it with a wash is beneficial generally. So you're probably, when you're done applying any bright highlights to the mail, you go back in with at least a light uh, black wash over everything. Just, just tie everything together and doll it down, sort of make it smooth and even because with the overbrushing, if you don't do that, it tends to look bad. Uh, you can even add sort of a secondary color wash here. I often find that's a nice effect like um, Seraphim Sepia, um, some 
Antillinian camo shade, whatever you want, just to give it a slight cast to add some extra interest and variation to uh, the look of the male. Uh, even make it rusty if you want. Probably not on most figures like this, but there's a lot of things you can do just to add interest, model some colors in there and stuff like that. But the main thing is you probably do wanna make sure that you're, you're probably gonna wanna finish off the whole thing with a wash when you're finished. Next, I'm base coating is kind of surcoat here. Uh, I'm obviously going to be using the same colors and same sort of heraldry that I used on the caparison. Uh, the base coat I've got here is a mixture of chocolate brown and a Citadel Jokero orange. I decided to simplify my orange painting process here a little bit from what I did on the caparison first because I thought I could improve on it a little bit, and also because this is a relatively small area, so it doesn't need the amount of detail or sort of layers, in my opinion. I'm also going to be painting the whole um, shaft of his lance in orange because they often had colorful lances and I think it makes the whole figure look a little bit more interesting. You'll notice I also painted a non-metallic metal tip on the spear a little earlier. Um, it's again, it, it's the same process that we used before, keeping sort of a dark, some, some dark gradients sort of blended together as the base and you can see I used a very light white gray shade to sort of put a fine edge between all the sort of different segments. Um, sorry I couldn't show it on camera. Again, it's an area It's very, very difficult for me to film that in a way that you can actually uh, see what I'm doing. So anyway, I'm just going to go ahead here and finish up the base coat on these areas. My next highlight on the orange here is going to just be a pure uh, Jokera orange. It is a base color from Citadel, which means it's thicker and has pretty good coverage. So. Uh, you will need to probably take it out of the bottle and thin it down a little bit. Uh, nonetheless, because it is orange, it's going to take multiple layers to get a good even result. So you can see that's what I'm doing here. I'm just applying it and sort of gradually building it up. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, wrinkling and folding in the back of the surcoat, so I can kind of sort to emphasize some folds and wrinkles there. And on the uh, lands, what I'm really doing is I'm just making sort of, I'm using a fairly big brush here because it's easier and I'm just applying sort of long, one sort of long vertical stroke along the length of the uh, spear and then I'm just rotating and applying another and keep rotating around until I've kind of done all sort of sides of it. And then I'm going to have to go back in and you have to obviously do that several times to get everything looking uh, smooth and even and you're just aiming for a point where there's no sort of breaks or sort of unevenness in the sort of the color uh, on your, um, the area that you're painting. Now I'm repeating the highlight process in the orange with a Citadel Fire Dragon orange, which is an even more difficult color to paint than the Jokero orange. Uh, it's really thin enough out of the bottle that you could paint it on, but I do not do that because if you do, it, it's a little bit hard to control. It, it doesn't really flow uh, quite well enough, unfortunately, so you probably want to add some water or some um, glaze medium or something to it a little bit just to get a better, more even flow out of. Of course, the problem is as soon as you do that, uh, the sort of the coverage of the paint sort of really tanks at that point and you're going to get really thin, bad coverage. Uh, so you're going to have to really, especially with this color, go in and apply lots and lots of thin, even layers on everything until uh, you get kind of the result you want. Uh, the good news is that I think this approach to the orange meant, means that the whole thing is already looks a lot brighter already, so you don't necessarily maybe need quite so many layers of just the fire dragon orange uh, by itself uh, to get a good result. And we are going to apply sort of one more highlight layer on top of this uh, as well, so it's not super duper critical, you know, as much maybe that you go over this really 300 times like we did when we were painting the horse. Uh, now I've just mixed some basic skin tone into the Jokero orange, which really improves the uh, coverage of the paint, and I'm going to use that to build up some extra highlights on the orange, which are more in line with the look of the comparison, which is a more uh, pale, dusty orange, thanks to the fact that I'm using that basic skin tone in there. If you do not like the look of that, you may uh, want to stop with just the fire dragon orange or you could try uh, mixing in some bright yellow the problem is that and it's, it's that's gonna be another really highly saturated bright color so you're gonna have real problems again with the coverage so 
uh, it's really to your taste. Uh, maybe this is not as brilliant, but on the other hand, I kind of like the look of it. So, uh, and I'm just gonna go and do what I just did with the other layers uh, and just sort of build it up. Uh, I'm spending a little bit more time blending this color because of its sort of paleness and its extra coverage. If you don't uh, do that, it's, it's just not gonna look as nice. So you need to really spend time making sure it sort of transitions nicely into the more sort of saturated, uh, less pale orange colors uh, that we applied earlier. Uh, that's particularly uh, time consuming on the lance, as you can imagine. I'm also gonna kind of uh, finish up. I didn't really talk about this, but when I'm painting the lance, um, I kind of try to make sure the color is even and consistent on all sides. But then when I'm about to finish with um, a layer, I just do one extra sort of bright saturated streak up uh, two sides of the lands and those sides sort of coincide with the flats of the spear tip. So, you know, where the area where you've got that, all that bright light on the two front sides, I'm making sort of a brighter line running up the spear too. So that kind of gives the effect that you've got or the idea that you've got kind of these uh, bright sort of reflections or lights that are sort of are hitting two sides of the spear at least, which makes it just a little bit more interesting in my opinion than if you kind of just leave it kind of only in uh, one color everywhere on all sides. Uh, now I've got a mixture of, of Vallejo Chocolate Brown and the Jokera Orange, and I'm using that with a fine number zero brush to block in the heraldry pattern on the surcoat. I am just duplicating the same sort of pattern that I did on the comparison, but I've scaled it down a whole bunch, obviously, so it fits better on the knight, the rider, you know, it just makes sense with him. Uh, and it's just, I've divided, you just, again, you're just really dividing the back and front into four quadrants and then painting half of those with that diagonal pattern. I'm also going to paint, um, just horizontal stripes around the shaft of the spear and kind of alternate colors on those too, just to make things a little bit more interesting. And now I've got that dark sea gray out again, and I'm using that again with my very fine brush to very carefully color in. Uh, the areas that I want to be um, the gray or the white in the pattern here. Uh, nothing very difficult about this except, of course, you just need to practice good brush control and you will probably run into some issues where it's hard to reach areas you need to paint and you know you have to just be careful not to mess up uh, your previous work. But other than that, this is always a very fun, satisfying step because you really uh, get good coverage with the dark sea gray and you immediately start to get to see how the pattern is going to look. At this point I took a little bit of a break from painting the gray and white aerials on the heraldry to apply a light wash all over the armor. Now this is something you can do once the uh, armor itself is painted just to help unify the whole metal to tie things together and also to give it a slight cast because in my opinion I think metal like this tends to look better with a slight color caster. The most traditional choice for a wash like this is going to be blue. Uh, that works in almost all cases and a slight bluish cast is almost always a, a good look for armor like this. But I want to do something a little less conventional so I'm using purple here and I've got a Citadel Leviathan purple wash, that's the old color name, and I've thinned it down a lot. You do not want to do this right straight out of the bottle because you'll get too intense a look and your knight's going to look kind of too fantasy or too garish or whatever. So whatever color you're using, thin it down considerably and make sure you're really applying a light wash. You really only want a subtle kind of color look to it. You may not in fact even be able to see it on camera, but with any luck you can see that there's a sort of warmth and sort of slight purplishness that is developing here on the steel. And purple is a neat choice, I think, because first of all, it looks nice. It's less classical, but it works uh, really, really well, I think, with the orange we've already got on this model because uh, orange and purple, I, if I'm not mistaken, are complementary colors to each other. So when you use them together like this, it, it just really unifies everything. And it just, I think with this model, it's just a really correct choice. But of course, if you don't want to be experimental like this, feel free to go with blue because that's um, a color that will work with almost everything. Uh, I'm now returning to uh, highlighting the white areas on the livery. Uh, now I've got some Vallejo Sky Gray that I'm applying everywhere. I've got the paint fairly um, thin and I'm going over carefully applying just uh, sort of nice smooth even coats and building it up. Uh, nothing too straight 
or nothing too complicated, I should say. Uh, be I'm keeping the paint thin here, um, mostly because it's easier to apply, but also because it allows me to uh, build it up and get more just different variations in tone, especially on his surcoat where I want there to be some wrinkles and creases. And this kind of saves me from doing it this way, from having to just mix more individual shades of paint. I'm just using one, but just building it up more in different areas. And now I'm gonna be finishing off the surcoat and the heraldry just using a pure white here. Again, same as last layer, I've got the white paint real thin and I'm gonna be gradually building it up so that I can get some nice extra tonal difference and you know, uh, make the wrinkles and creases in his um, jacket or his surcoat particularly interesting. And when I'm talking about the stripes on his lance, the main thing is just to try to get a smooth, even coat that's nice and brilliant and bright because the type of surface you've got there really getting uh, really specific highlights on it is pretty tricky. So I find like it really just works best there just to really just try to build up nice even uh, layers and make sure that you don't have any sort of unevenness in your coating or sort of areas where there's sort of the gray is showing through in sort of a blotchy way. That's something you really want to avoid. So just make sure you go over it enough that you can uh, compensate for that problem. Um, is, the lines on my lands are not as even as I would like them to be. When you're done, you can go back and correct for that to a certain extent by taking some of the um, chocolate brown and jocara orange mix that we use for sort of outlining the heraldry and then go back in and carefully uh, outline around the white bands. And that lets you kind of just even them out, uh, kind of make the orange stripes a little bit wider if you need to, uh, things like that. Just, you're probably gonna need to do that just to tidy up a little bit assuming of course that you are as sloppy with this kind of geometric work as I am. I'm doing very precise geometric things is not my strong suit, but you know, it's possible that you'll be better at that than I am. Painting uh, non-metallic uh, gold or brass is really a whole nother thing to itself. And there's really not enough of that uh, surface on this night for me to really do do a really thorough tutorial on it. So maybe I'll cover it at some other point, but he does have sort of a belt that I want to be sort of a brass gold and also sort of some of the hardware on his uh, dagger. I just base coated those areas with a mixture of uh, German camouflage black brown and Aberlin Sunset, which is from Citadel. And I want it for a real dark yellow brown. What I'm gonna then do is go back in with my Aberlin Sunset and just start uh, picking out on the belt at least to sort of the individual plates in that belt and sort of just start highlighting um, up the areas on the dagger. This, because it's such a small area and actually it's quite a bit in the shadows under his arm like that, you don't need to spend a lot of time with it and you're not gonna really get really complicated non-metallic metal effects you have to deal with. Um, after I applied the Aberlin Sunset to it and got that nice and even, I then uh, mix some white into my Averlin Sunset to get kind of a paler, brighter yellow, and I'm just going to sort of start applying highlights. So what I'm doing is just applying the really light colors kind of along the top edge of the belt. Again, it's anywhere light is hitting, just sort of that area is brighter, maybe a thin line down the side of the plates in certain areas. Uh, I finished up then by just taking some pure white with just a hint of the yellow in it. And I use that as sort of a very sharp edge highlight just to define uh, some areas where there's uh, really bright reflections on the metal. It's really the same principle as what I was doing with the steel. It's just in much smaller areas, it's really just kind of dotting on color here in this case. So it's, it, it's, it's again, it's not really, really, really crucial uh, what you uh, do here, but uh, if people are interested, I will try and find an excuse to talk more about brass and gold type surfaces later on. At this point, there's not really much left to paint on the knight except uh, the leather scabbards and grips on his dagger and sword. So I'm base coating those right now using uh, German camouflage black brown. Once that's done, I'm going to go ahead and do the sort of the standard a technique that I use for highlighting leather. So uh, I'm first going to apply an overall highlight of sort of chocolate brown, um, sort of not really worry too much about, you know, picking out edges or anything, just put that pretty much all over, uh, build it up. Uh, then I'm then gonna take some Vallejo cork brown uh, and mix that into my chocolate brown to apply an extra highlight layer and sort of build up, especially on the larger sword scabbard, some 
subtle gradients and sort of smooth transitions uh, between the different areas. Uh, and I'm going to continue that process with some um, pure cork brown, uh, blending it out really carefully. I, I want to keep that really light, uh, pale leather, mostly along sort of the edges and on the grips, particularly of the sword and the dagger is going to be sort of wrapped panels of leather. So you can start using the light uh, cork brown to pick out those individual strips um, and just running it as a thin edge highlight along the scabbards. Uh, I finished up by taking a little bit of the basic skin tone finally and mixing it into my cork brown to get a very light shade, uh, which I then applied as just an edge highlight uh, along, you know, all those sort of sort of sharp areas on the edges of the scabbards and just as a really extra bright highlight when I was wanting to define the grip. Also, don't forget like I did uh, when I was filming this segment that the bassinet actually has a sort of leather trim or piece around the bottom back of it. Uh, and you need to paint that too in leather. That's what it would have been. And you can use the same techniques that I'm using here, the same color build up, you know, sort of start dark and then highlight along the top edge of it. Um, that's why, but I didn't show it on camera because uh, I didn't actually think about it until after it was done because you kind of, you don't necessarily notice it uh, if you aren't paying attention. Okay, so here is the finished um, Hundred Years War era um, Mounted Knight. Uh, with the completed horse in the orange caparison, all the livery, and with a sort of a dark style of non-metallic metal. Uh, this was a very time-consuming figure for me, I'm not <laughs> going to lie, or at least it was time-consuming by the standard of uh, what I usually do for videos. Um, but that being said, it certainly um, was really not that time intensive as far as what you can put into painting non-metallic metal particularly I could have um, easily spent a lot more time smoothing and perfecting the look of the metal trying to get better more believable reflections on the surfaces all that kind of thing uh, and it'll just look better but uh, this is uh, me trying to sort of compromise a little bit between a good result and being practical and keeping this within reasonable sort of time limits uh, for you guys uh, I'm overall very, very pleased with how this turned out, at least in terms of, you know, the overall look. Yes, I could have done some things better. Um, you know, there's things I would definitely improve, like, you know, maybe get better at painting the orange. But, you know, I, I, I made this figure extra challenging for myself, and then I filmed it for you guys to watch. So in some ways, this is you getting to see me, you know, having to really deal with hard problems and just trying to work through them. And sometimes uh, I'm more successful uh, and other times less successful, but you know, that's part of learning to paint and getting better. And you know, I think it's important that you get a sense of that too. Uh, so if you enjoyed this video, of course, please like it, uh, share it naturally, uh, leave me comments with what you thought. If you want to see more metallic metal, probably you do, uh, let me know about that. Uh, and of course you can subscribe to my channel as well if you haven't done so already to keep up with the latest updates. Um, so that's all for now and I will see you next time.